How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the Blue Shooting. Welcome back to the Seabed. I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, you guys have indicated that we're not quite there yet, but we're we're finally kind of approaching it. We're getting some revelations. We're going to see what's going to happen. Uh, however, if I remember correctly, we have a tip to explore, which was the second half of the like trip. If I remember, it was somebody who went to Tokyo to meet up with an old friend who happened to be running an inn or motel in the Tokyo area, or like a chain of them. Um, they didn't quite get to like meet up and catch up like they hoped to, but they still got a lot of free furniture and they got to explore a little bit. I think we're going to see the tail end of that journey because that's what it's called, like if we go here into tips. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's Lily, told from the perspective of Lily. Uh, second trip, there's an escape immersion, and at the end of the second trip, that I'm pretty sure we haven't done this one. So let's jump right in. Whew. Let's see. Man, the last episode was nuts. Wake up! It looks incredible outside! Feeling like someone was calling out to me, I opened my eyes. The seats of the bus trembled as the driver skillfully navigated through the crooked uh, country road. I had finally managed to fall asleep just earlier, but I didn't feel like I could repeat I could repeat the feat again. Resigning myself to, the fate, to, to that fate, I instead looked out the window. There was no point in even confirming that the seat next to me had been unoccupied. The voice that woke me up came from a distant memory. Interesting. A friend that used to be by my side was no longer there. I said that, but it wasn't like she had passed away or anything. It was just that one day she forgot all her memories about me. She probably did it consciously too. Okay, interesting. So she had a friend who didn't leave. She just forgot about her. And that's effectively dying. And did it consciously too, that's very sad. I still couldn't understand the reason why. We had known each other since we were little. Wait a minute, is this about Takako? She had always been a little strange, but I simply couldn't imagine her ending up like that, given her personality. The bus finally reached the mountain path. Looking out the window, I, st I started spotting patches of snow as we drove uphill. The amount of snow increased the higher we went. By the time my ears started ringing from the pressure difference between the lowlands and the mountains, the snow walls around the road had exceeded the bus's height. Oh wow, yeah, I've, I've seen that a couple times. I think it happened a lot more when my dad was younger than for me, but uh, like I, grew up at, I grew up in the west and my grandpa lived in Montana and they got tons of snow. I remember my friend saying how the sight reminded her of Moses in the Red Sea. The tour conductor stood up from her seat and began talking about our trip. Basically, we could do whatever we wanted as long as we returned to the bus on time. She then began explaining the two alternative courses the passengers were free to choose from, one for beginners and another for more experienced. The bus stopped almost at the same time her explanation ended. The tour guide reminded us of the departure time one more time before the bus doors opened. I'd be paranoid. I probably wouldn't be able to do the hard, harder one. The passengers scattered, each of them going to their chosen direction. Reminiscing about the last time I'd been here, I turned 360 degrees and take in the snowy panorama surrounding me. The sky was clear and blue above the white mountains, just like, just like back then. Hey, so where do we go for a beginner's course? She asked me. That was the, her memory of her. Weren't you listening? Well, I wasn't. I thought you would, anyway. I guess we both did get, we get, got a little bit overly excited by the snow, I, def I deflected. Oh, well, then let's follow where everyone's going. I didn't want to panic over small details like this, and she wasn't the type to complain about them either. We found the longest train of people nearby and mixed in with them, eventually entering a relatively small wooden structure. Yeah, I'm th this might be Sachiko and Takako. Which is weird, because the first part in this category about the trip was the trip to Tokyo. Inside, we found a souvenir store and a cable car station. We observed a line of tourists buying tickets for the cable car. We did the same, lined up behind them. Cable cars sound like fun. Well, as far as like, I'm not a big fan of hiking. Well, like I'm kind of, like I like hiking, but I like casual hiking. I don't like hardcore hiking. From a closer look, I realized it was a, tor a trolley bus, not a cable car. I checked the faces of the people around us as we waited. I hadn't memorized the faces of our tour mates, but I was pretty sure I'd never seen these people before. It seemed like we'd mixed in with an entirely different group. So he was looking around as well, probably thinking the same thing. I've never ridden a trolley bus before, she said. Me neither. It seemed like she had grown a little worried. Looks like it's going through a tunnel, I said. Not wrong voice there. Hmm, she replied. 
like I said, I'm kind of just guessing that these are memories uh, because like Takako's the only person we know of that kind of lost memory. Once the trolley bus had parked next to us, we boarded it with the rest of the tourists. The seat in front of it was open, so I sat down there. We had the same spot back then, too. The same speed speedometer caught my eye as, as back then. The tunnel I could see through in, front, in the front window was dark and narrow. Being in a bus racing through that tunnel at a relatively high speed was quite thrilling. Back then, I didn't really have time to enjoy it, though. We were looking at the trolley bus timetable to confirm whether we could get back to our bus on time. But we weren't sure what to do or how long it would take, so we couldn't even make the uneducated guess. Hmm. Ooh, the trolley bus stopped. We arrived at a place that looked like a lot like a wooden structure we'd left with an almost identical souvenir store and bus station. Relying on my old memories, I left the souvenir store and ascended the concrete stairs. I opened the door at the top of the stairs and entered a lookout area. A dark mountain range extended in front of me in the distance. The lookout was built at an angle that allowed a full view of the mountains, provided the weather was clear. Layers of snow covered the mountains like a set of beautiful white roots sparkling under the blue sky. Alright, so I know in Japan they have a lot of mountains, but I don't know how big those mountains are. For instance, I grew up out in the western United States where we had the Rockies, and with mountains it was like boom, and like they were year, they cooked snow caps almost yearly, like year round, and uh, they were just monumental, like, monsters. I remember there was a, probably the gnarliest hike I ever went on was called Table Rock. It was like, you could take the steep way, which I think was about 8 miles, or you could take the long way, which was like 14 miles. And that was considered a, like, average hike. Like, it was a, it was a day hike, but it would be like your whole day. And, uh, that's probably the toughest hike I've ever been on. Beautiful views, but my goodness. Like, for such a big hike, it would only go, like, there were mountains that were still around to start towering. Specifically, it'd take, it'd take you, like, right in front of the Grand Teton Mountains, which are freaking gorgeous looking. Uh, so, I always grew up with that image of mountains and hiking. However, now that I'm out east, I'm in the Appalachian Mountains, and the mountains here, they, they really don't look like mountains like I grew up on. But, I mean, they're, they're, they're big, and... You can hike them, but like they're more like maybe two mile hikes, three mile hikes up and back. Like they're not a whole, they're not super impressive compared to what I knew. So I just don't know what kind of mountains there are in Japan. Like I know there's Mount Fuji, which is freaking humongous, and it's got snow on it like all the time. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of other mountains nearby, but I don't see a whole lot of pictures of them per se. So I'm guessing, based on this picture, that she, this is a memory from a trip they probably took out to maybe, they, could they be in the Alps, perhaps? Or maybe they're in, like, the United States and California still. I don't know. It had been, a lot, been to a lot of places, but nowhere else I could see colors like that. Confirming that the scenery hadn't changed over the years, I drew away from the railing and found a bench to sit on further back. This time, I simply took in the scenery over the heads of the other tourists. Eventually, a group came in through the door and completely blocked my field of view. A guide began introducing the mountains, talking over gape, gasps of awe from the newcomers. I closed my eyes, forming the scenery of the mountain in my mind, as well as myself sitting next to my friend. Unable to find the words to express myself, I simply shifted my eyes from one corner of the breathtaking scenery to the other. She was better with words than me, so I gave up on coming up with something to do something to do the scenery justice, and instead waited for her to say something. However, as unusual as that was, she remained silent as well. Instead, she seemed to be too taken in by the scenery to talk. The mountains were indeed amazing, but she also was gazing at the white plains extending below them. Hang on. That looks more like, uh... Oh shoot, she's the, the nurse. She looks more like the nurse. The guy's speech ended and the lookout fell silent as the group left. Only a few families that didn't seem to belong to any group still lingered around. You're not going to join the walk down, young lady? Asked a man that had unexpectedly sat down beside me a bit earlier. I was in my late 20s, so I looked around to confirm whether he wasn't addressing someone else. But there was no one else around me, so I nodded. At, that close, at, at the closer look, the man looked like he was in his 50s or 60s. His thick, naked wrists uh, peeked out from under his coat, indicating that he had either did sports or worked in the fields, both requiring a lot of physical strength. The scenery's amazing down there. You almost wouldn't believe it's Japan. So it is Japan. Interesting. 
What about you? Are you not going? I didn't have much I didn't have much expertise speaking to someone in his age group, which made me somewhat hesitant. Nonetheless, I ended up responding to him anyway. Ah, I ran out of breath, so I decided to take a break here. Besides, I've already been there like a hundred times. The man looked at me. You don't look like part of the tour. Are you traveling alone? I wore weathered clothes that favored mobility over style. I had a large backpack on my shoulders. It must have looked like a wilderness camper, to be, truth be told. You could say that. How long have you been traveling? About half a year now. That's nice, said the man. He then went on. It's best to travel while you're still young. Do you have a goal of some sort? Oh, snap, calling it right up to attention. I mulled over. Uh, oh, he does what he said. Okay, you have a goal of some sort? I mulled over his question for a bit. I began my trip. I, I, I ran my trip because I thought it would help me understand why my friend had lost all her memories of me. It was prompted by my trip to the zoo half a year ago. That day, I felt like I saw a side of her I'd never known before. And I felt like I could find out even more if I retraced our shared steps. It was hard to explain it in concrete terms, though. I thought about it some more on my train ride home, but I couldn't come up with anything in the end. Then I figured I'd get off at the same station we used to in the past. I guess I don't really have much of a goal. I just got back from long from a break from uh, I just got a long break from work, so he gave him one side of the story. I gave him one side of the story. Mike continued to ask me questions for some time. I told him about the route that led me here and mentioned a few things that happened along the way. As we ran out of things to discuss and fell silent, the man glanced at the clock. Would you like to read a book? I reached, uh, reached into my backpack and took- oh. I guess she's saying that. Would you like to read a book? I reached into my backpack and took out a paperback novel I've been reading on the bus. I don't care much for books. They're all just a pack of lies anyway. Well, jeez. He shifted his gaze to the dam at the bottom of the mountain range. Back when I was a youngin', we didn't have electricity here. The small villages all had diesel plants, but they kept failing all the time. Oh, sorry, that's what he said. So when I was in elementary school, I had my teacher tell me all about how their engines worked. They weren't all that complicated, but without any knowledge, even the easiest fix would be a huge hurdle, let me tell you. Are you a mechanic? No, I didn't become that. We didn't have electricity, but we were short on food, too. So I worked in the fields, and would go sell extra yield to our neighboring, village neighboring villages. And, well, I couldn't tell you how they learned about me knowing a thing or two about gizmos, but one day, they asked me to fix a power plant. I see. He was telling me about the time long before I was born. I understood why he specialized in the sciences, but that didn't explain why he didn't like the books. Could this be a generation gap? Well, all things have a reason, the man said. I couldn't tell whether he was talking about the fact that he didn't like books or if he had already returned to the issue of the trip not having a goal. Before I had the chance to confirm that, it was time for me to board my trolley bus. I said goodbye to the man descended from my lookout. Hmm. I returned to the bus stop with a wooden building and killed some time in the souvenir store while waiting for the trolley bus to come. I spotted some cookies and chocolate named after the location. You can see those a lot in places like this. There are also some local character goods, so I personally found the plushie of, uh, of a snow chicken particularly cute. It was a bird whose feathers would turn white in the winter. It was a big statue by the entrance. There are also some pictures of it for sale. I suddenly realized my friend was probably looking for this bird from the lookout. I didn't realize it back then, but it was quite obvious in retrospect given how much of a bird lover she was. My trolley bus would soon arrive, so I moved over to the bus stop. Bird lover, bird lover. I, okay, I'm probably just being an idiot, but I'm having trouble confirming if that's supposed to be Takako or somebody else. And then I'm not buying anything. I almost bought a tasty looking ba uh, batter, a batira, or whatever that is, but I remembered seeing it's cheaper at the main station, which made me change my mind. Very practical. I decided to buy it later so I could enjoy it in the comfort of my train compartment on my way back. I was the first person to board the bus, took my seat and waited. This time I spotted some familiar faces among the people who boarded after me. Once the time came to leave, the other tourists had assembled and the guide made sure that everyone was present. After that, the bus rolled out of the station and toward the next destination. It was the highest waterfall in the country. Last time she made the 30 minute trip up that perilous mountain path all by herself just to reach the waterfall at the end of it. 
I'd given up as soon as I saw the slope and waited for her nearby in a nearby cafe. This time, I had to go where she went. I glanced at the neighboring seat. She looked out the window with narrowed eyes. You should bring a pair of sunglasses next time, she remarked. Yeah, see that? It just seems like Sachiko, but maybe so, maybe somebody else is going through something similar. Hmm, interesting. Well, that was weird. <laughs> I need to figure out what all this means! But, alright, we'll jump into the game and, uh, I don't know, see, see what we can explore for a little bit. So, Sachiko woke up after Narsaki kind of, like, talked about how she wasn't going to be around anymore. Now that Sachiko probably doesn't need her. As I rolled around the bed, the sheet slid down my shoulder. I opened my eyes and sat up. The decorative plant with heart-shaped leaves and the, sh and the sheet figuring sparkled in the morning sun, making me narrow my eyes. I placed my a palm on, the, on my empty stomach. I feel like I could start rumbling at any second now. Did I have anything for dinner? Before I knew it, the world beyond the window had turned snow white. Some frost had formed on the window glass and was sparkling in the sun. I gazed at it for a few minutes, then climbed out of bed. Ah, oh, chilly. It's, it's chilly here, so I gotta imagine. Ugh, oh, winter. I haven't heard this music in a while. The sweet aroma of coffee filled the cafeteria when I stepped inside. Spotted Nanai sleeping at her seat by the window with her head resting on the windowsill. There was a plate with a piece of toast on the table right next to a half-empty cup of coffee. I began reaching out toward Nana's shoulder, but stopped midway. Yeah, you remember? Last time we talked to her, things kind of got weird. Good morning. Good morning. Nana addressed me while I was stirring a frying pan. Good morning. I'm sorry for using the kitchen without your permission. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's my fault anyway. You should have woken me up. You looked like you were deep in thought. Did I? Nana sounded sounded a laugh. I slid a fried egg over the plate with toast while also adding some salad for a garnish. I then left the counter with the said plate in hand and placed it on the table Nana was sitting at. Um, about yesterday. What? Never mind. It's nothing. You know, I don't think I've ever had fried eggs. What's toast before? She cons considered the contents of my plate. It's just an old habit. My housemate loved fried eggs. I see. If there wasn't at least one thing she liked on the plate, she would never shut up about it. <laughs> um, can I have a taste? Go ahead. Now that I held up a piece of toast with three fingers and extended it toward me. So, okay. I guess... I always had that. I, I, I never thought about the fact that some people might not have eggs on toast, but like, that's one of my favorite breakfasts is to have like a, a fried egg on toast. It's so good. After I placed a slice of fried egg on it, she took a bite. And if you do it right and you have um, over easy eggs where you cook the white through, but you have a soft, like gooey um, yolk. Oh, it's the best. It's messy, but it's the best. <laughs> it's both salty and sweet. Pretty good, actually. Thanks. Can I have more? Sure. Nana no, no, thanked me and picked up another piece of toast. I put some fried egg on it again. Oh, yeah, I heard you took a liking to our library. Auntie said she often sees you there. Yeah, their silence helps me relax. That place is full of ancient books, and not much else. I doubt you'll find anything useful. Perhaps you're right. There's a particular shelf behind the stairs I tend to frequent. I have some more modern novels, along with magazines about cooking and fashion. I see you like keeping your things organized. Depends on the thing. Um, do you not like that library? It's not that. The place is a bit too silent for me, though. When I look high at the ceiling, it makes me feel like I'm a dead fish that sank to the bottom of the sea. Hmm. All it contains is old information and records that are no longer relevant to our age. That's an old malarkey. Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. Remember that. Now granted, I understand having a library full of a bunch of old books not very exciting, nor would I find myself reading a ton of them. But you should never discount the wealth of knowledge that would like, be there. Especially if you, if something were to happen and you suddenly got cut off and you're living on the mountain and had no means of ever leaving it ever again, having books like that could be incredibly helpful. 
It reminds me of all stuff, like ancient, rusted bicycles, cans of people fish out of from the sea. I thought you liked old things. I like old things that still serve a function. No, no, I suddenly made an awkward smile. Um, I'm sorry about yesterday. I was really drunk. I don't know if you were that drunk. I placed the coffee cup on the table. When I looked up, I saw Nana covering her face with one hand. I started running my mouth like some know-it-all. I'm getting all embarrassed just thinking about it. It's okay. I'm not upset. I sometimes forget to think about the consequences of my actions. Everyone does that sometimes. Ha! <laughs> this reminds me of the worst essay I wrote in my life, back when I applied at an art school. I didn't know what to write about, so I began describing what kinds of talents I had in a minute's detail. Ooh, yeah, that's not great. <laughs> You're writing an essay. You're supposed to be talking to an arts college. You just talk about yourself. Normally, you'd write about your motivation and plans for your school year, but I did many things that make me want to kill myself in retrospect. I agree. I always tell myself not to run my mouth, but it all falls apart the moment I get too excited about something. Well, we all fit in this world like puzzle pieces, after all. Uh, I don't know if you're trying to help, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't bring that up again. Really? Hmm, well, I'll interpret it in a positive way this time. <sighs> now that I made a faint smile. I ended up unable to contain a smile myself. We continued cheerfully chatting for a while. Okay, this is the Nana I like! Drunk Nana is a terrible idea, she should avoid her. <laughs> After we finished, Nana I picked up our empty plates on the table, walked by the counter, and began washing them in the sink. She offered me a second cup of coffee, but I refused. I had been feeling sleepy since morning, but I didn't feel like caffeine would help. With my head still feeling somewhat heavy, I looked around the cafeteria while sipping what remained of my coffee. Ever since coming here, I'd been the only guest to use this huge room. When I thought about it that way, it all felt barely extravagant. Hmm. So, what are... Putting aside Nane's very aggressive coming on, would coming up and living here for Sachiko be that bad? I mean... She has her own her own job, and it's really cool that she has her own business, but it's so tied up with Takako, it might be a bad idea to continue. What if she just sold her rights to it, and lived out here? Like, it's sounding more and more like a good idea now that we've seen all this, like, other crap. Oh, my back sore. But, I don't know, let's see. Let's try and get more information, but her trip's gonna come to an end pretty soon. For a while, I gazed at the lavish stained glass and the decorations and the lamps around it. Eventually, my eyes wandered to the pictures on the wall. The first one I looked at was a group picture with Nanae, her mother, and Lily. My gaze traveled further, pass passing my pictures of Nanae when she was little, and then, a and, and then a well by the mansion that was no longer here. As I gazed at Nanae's childhood picture, I suddenly felt like something was off. I stopped on one particular picture and gave it a closer look. Nanae and some other child were playing in a plastic pool. The inner yard of the mansion was visible in the background. As I frowned, trying to figure out what was bothering me, I suddenly saw something that had the corner of my eye. I glanced at the window and saw Narasaki walking through the inner yard. Wait, wait. I thought she wasn't real and not here. What? What? Darn it! Maybe there's more going on! I thought she was gone! Narasaki passed by the road leading to the library. I left the cafeteria and followed her, eventually finding an inter in 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 incinerator just before the exit to the mountain path. Nozaki stood in front of it with her back turned to me. I took a slow step forward, trying not to alert her. However, I ended up stepping on a dry tree twig. It cracked loudly under my foot. Hello. Hey. She turned around and looked, took one hand out of her pocket to greet me. She's in her lab coat. I continued toward Narasaki with all the twigs and withered leaves popped up and cracked under my feet. I wanted to surprise you, but it's impossible on a road like this. Narasaki's usually sleepy looking eyes slightly widened. I don't recall you being the type to pull cute for little pranks. Hey, even I can enjoy stuff like that when I'm in a good mood. Oh, Narasaki smiled. I lined up next to her and looked at the incinerator. What are you doing? I was taking a walk when I found a nice warm place to warm up. 
The temperatures really dropped down this morning, didn't it? Indeed. Crimson light illuminated her from behind. The tongues of flame danced wildly within the center hole of the incinerator. Narasaki's red locks swaying in the hot wind looked almost like they were on fire. Hmm. I was reading the bird encyclopedia. It felt like trying to find some specimens out in the wild, so I went out into the forest. You wouldn't believe how cold it was. Still, the fog covered the area light covering the area lends the scenery an alluring, otherworldly quality. Did you find anything any birds in the end? I heard all sorts of chirping, but I could only spot a few through the fog. The best one was a scaly thrush sitting on the stem of the winter suite. Uh, winter suite. That was quite a charming sight. It sounds nice. I'd love to see that too. Better wear a thick coat then. The forest freezing in the cold in the morning. Noted. Narasaki was right. I could already feel the cold wind robbing me of beat. I took a step forward, gazing at the dancing flame in the incinerator's mouth. I glanced at Narasaki, spotting a stain of soot or perhaps dirt on her face. Yeah, the doll. Upon taking a closer look, I realized that the sleeves of her white coat were covered in dirt too. How far? How far did you go? I got up pretty early, so I must have wandered for quite far into the woods. After I point out the stains on her face, she brushed it off with her hand. <sighs> I suppose you were never one to show restraint. I got a sudden job request, so I'm leaving in the evening. It's not very d every day I can come so deep into the mountains, so I figured I'd experience as much of the place as possible to make sure I wouldn't regret it later. Well, that was certainly sudden. That's how jobs work. I suppose so. What's your plan for me? You haven't been hallucinating or hearing things lately, correct? Perhaps not right now, but who knows when it might relapse. Narasaki made a troubled face and shook her head. To be honest, I wasn't planning on coming here to begin with. For one, you seem to be getting better, but there's also the possibility that I myself could end up facilitating, facilitating your hallucinations. Nonetheless, if something does happen, don't be afraid to turn to the people here for help. Not I will understand, and it seems like Lily actually has experience with your kind of condition. As for Kozula, she will lend you an ear at least. She might be little, but she's smart. They're all on your side. Narasaki threw the dry twig she'd been holding into the incinerator. There was a little pop, and a trace of ash burst into the air. Well, I guess I'll survive. I observed the black burning lump of soot, but it soon fell apart and lost its prior shape. A wisp of smoke blowing from the chimney carried the excess ash away. I wonder what they were burning here. No idea. No matter what it was, it's just ash now. That's a sad way to put it. Not really. Ash rises into the air and melts with the clouds, only to return to the earth with rain. It fertilizes the ground and gives birth to plants. And eventually those plants get digested by animals and turn into meat. There are lots of things you can do, even after you become ash. So you can still return to life, even from that state. I wonder if I could re return to being myself after traveling all over the world as Ash. That'd be another person at that point. It'd be interesting if they retained your personality, but they wouldn't know me. They wouldn't know them. Narasaki smiled as she gazed in front of her. The human body has about six trillion cells, and they keep dying and being replaced by fresh ones. The cells in the head have somewhat longer lifespans, but they all get replaced within a year or so as well. If you look at it that way, you're no longer the same person you were a year ago. We both chuckled. No one had noticed, though. Narasaki replied with a smile. We then spent some time silently gazing at the flames and the prey there in the incinerator. I think we should head back. We might catch a cold out here. Narasaki most likely noticed me rubbing my arms. Okay, I said as I returned to the mansion with her. So is she real? I really think she's not real. <sighs> After a couple of steps, I turned behind me to look at the incinerator again. What's wrong? Narasaki, who had been walking in front of me, also turned around. I felt like something had pricked my heart. It was a very faint feeling, but I'm certain it wasn't just my imagination. I focused on the sensation, trying to submerge myself into the dark corner of my mind, where the answer most likely lay, but couldn't quite succeed. It came, out, it came to when Narasaki placed her hand on my shoulder. Did you remember something bad? 
After touching my face to confirm my existence, I shook my head. Well, why do you ask? Because you look a little pale. Really? I began walking toward the inner guard with Narasaki trailing behind me. That was interesting. Speaking of which... Ahem. <clears throat> Speaking of which, you two are planning to make a rest area in here, aren't you? Asked Narasaki as we reached the lobby. Nana wants to use this corner for it. Hmm. Are you sure there's enough space? It's not like that many people come here, at least according to Nana, eh? Hmm. Besides, this place is more atmospheric when it's a bit cramped. Really? Well, I'm not really an expert on an artistic thing, so I wouldn't know. As I scanned my memory for the layout we designed with Nanae, my heart began beating faster as I realized that the incinerator and the smoke blowing from its chimney earlier reminded me of a funeral. But that was all. I kept telling myself there was nothing more to it. If you've got no other plans, I'd recommend going to sleep early tonight. All I've done recently was sleep, I said while recalling all my napping, sp spot napping spots across the mansion. You came here to take a break from work, didn't you? If you feel sleepy, then sleep your heart's content while you have the chance. No one's gonna drag you out of bed here. Now that Narasaki mentioned it, I did indeed feel somewhat drowsy. I felt like I'd fall asleep as soon as I hit the bed. I suppose you have a point. It wasn't like I had anything important to do here, so I listened to the doctor and went straight to my room. Narasaki climbed the stairs and walked down the corridor with me, almost like some kind of bodyguard. The warm air caressed my chilled body as I opened the door. It was much warmer than I thought, so I glanced at the heater, but it was off. I hung my coat on the back of the chair and sat down on the bed. Narasaki closed the curtains and began fiddling with the heater, trying to set the more comfortable temperature. I laid on the bed, closed my eyes, and opened them again to look at Narasaki. She was on her way to leave the room. Um, I addressed her back, making her turn around. I wanted to thank her, but I wasn't entirely really sure what for. You want me to stay by your side until you fall asleep? Narasaki returned and sat down in the chair. It's like a goodbye. We spent some time chatting. She remained seated in the chair while I was still lying in bed. Her voice relaxed me. You need to imagine that kind of work, she made a remark about the company Takako and I founded. Have you ever thought about ideas? A thought of ideas as a spring? Not really, but I remember Takako saying something along those lines. She likened them to a well, though. I think she said that every person has their own well inside them, and that all the feeling they have that felt up, uh, they have felt up until that point were stored there. And to convey them into other people, you had to scoop them out with your well and carry them to theirs. But not much can fit into the palms of your hands, so you can't avoid spilling some along the way. It's only a fraction gets conveyed in the end. That's why you've got to work for it. You've got to make yourself a bucket. Words, music, and pictures are manifestations of it in the real world. People eventually discover different vessels of their souls. Hmm. That's an interesting metaphor. Takako must have done a good job if you really think that. I see. Indeed, there was something in her as well. And you were truly in love with her. Where does that come from? You always cheer up when you start talking about her. Really? I was asleep before I realized it. And likely due to how often I slept during the day, I had yet another dream. I, as a little child, was in a small, round room. There were countless familiar-looking toys scattered on the floor. Some were waiting for me by the door. Beyond it was a special waterway built by, by that person. person. Narasaki was already gone when I opened my eyes. I glanced at the door and remembered how she left. I'm glad to have someone like you to rely on, I said, still in the bed. No one truly cares about me now that Takako's gone. Hey, you got plenty of friends in the office. Yes, but it's different when you know someone for most of your life. When I'm talking with you, I always feel like I've returned to the past. Is that so? Narasaki broke our gaze. She smiled and wished me good night. I did the same, and the door closed. Hmm. Oh. 
I don't know if I want to go much further tonight. Hmm. Maybe a little longer. I woke up at the same time as usual. I would usually wake up at the same time, regardless of my schedule. I would not run late for work, but that also meant that even if I stayed late on the weekend, I would still end up waking up early the next day. I'm kind of the same way. This skill earned me a supplementary prize for attendance in high school, but sometimes it felt more like a curse. Yeah, I never won any attendance prizes because I usually got sick or something, but like, I got close. I hadn't been working quite well lately. I hadn't been, I, it hadn't been working quite as well lately, probably due to how severely exhausted I was. But this morning, everything suddenly went back to normal. I was already up and about at 7 a.m. It had been a while since my last dream, too. I couldn't remember when I had slept, when I went to sleep yesterday, so I decided to read the book left in the bed to kill some time. But I wasn't feeling sleepy, even after 30 minutes of reading. I must have slept well last night, so I pulled myself together and got out to bed. Something definitely feels different this time. Hey, Kosova. I passed the flower bed in the inner yard and circled around the building to see Kosova standing among the bamboo trees in the sword fence. She kept looking at both the ground and the piece of paper in her hand. Hmm. Hey, the well! What are you doing? I came closer to her. She showed me the black, a black and white picture she held. It depicted a stone well. I was looking for an old well. There stood an ancient looking moss covered well in front of us. I peeked down into it, seeing only muddy water. Looks like you found it. Yeah. Do you know how old the picture is? It was taken six years ago. I found it in the pamphlet you can get at the station. The well looks a lot nicer in the pictures. The stones are all made of had now had made of had now cracked and various varieties of vegetation were growing all over it. Only in six years? The planks covering it seemed to be rotting away too. I didn't realize it deteriorated so fast when not in use. Kozo returned the picture to the file and put it in her bag. Why were you looking for an abandoned well anyway? I thought I could find ghosts here. The air was surrounded by buildings and woods, keeping it perpetually shaded. You can almost believe one would meet a ghost or two here at night. Hmm. I heard the cry of a bird from the distance in the inner yard. Kozova turned to me. She gave me a hard look, narrowing her round eyes. I just wanted to see what it was after looking at the picture. Perhaps she intended that part to be about ghosts as a joke. I see. What are you doing here? I was looking for someone. Hmm, I was the only one here all morning. I see. Thanks. I thanked her and shifted my gaze to the well. It was covered with planks, but no one seemed to have gone missing, revealing the well's interior through the gap. Kozo and I both peered into the darkness of the well. I tried looking for the penguin toy we talked about the other day, but I couldn't find it in the end, said Kozo, her eyes not leaving the well. All I found was this. It was in a vase in our living room. She pulled something out of her pocket and held her hand in front of me. When I opened my palm, she placed a small figure of a black penguin on it. I kept wondering whether the two of us ever discussed penguins. That's what I think it was her and Narsaki. I used to hide important things in that vase when I was little. I always found, I also found a watch Grandpa gave me, some beads, and a toy ring inside it. Seeing all these nostalgic items brought back memories. When the penguin toy ran out of batteries, I took the black one out of it. I took the black one out of the ice slide and played with it alone for a while. I thought it was cursed to only ever climb up the mountain and slide back down it again, but it ended up joining the games of the other toys in my room. So somehow it ended up in that vase. Do you think that ultimately turned out well for him? Perhaps. Penguin laid on its belly in my palm, its eyes gazing upward. It didn't appear unhappy, at least. You can have it, said Kozua. Isn't it important for you, though? Oh, don't sweat it. I'm too old to be playing with that thing like that anyway. And you'll be leaving soon, right? It can't be something to remind you of this trip. Of course, you could throw it away if you don't want it. 
I couldn't help feeling surprised. If you're giving me a present like that, probably meant she didn't want me to go forget her. I was under the impression she wasn't all that interested in other people, and preferred to stay away from the kind of relationship. But perhaps I was wrong. Thank you. I'll make sure to take good care of it. Kozo pulled up her sleeve and looked at the watch on her exposed wrist while I slid the penguin on into the pocket of my jacket. I'm meeting Lily's architect friend today. Oh, I have an architect friend today. After spending so much time researching this mansion, I guess I ended up being interesting in the, interested in the person who actually built it. Oh, that's a good idea. They might not be all that welcoming of the idea, though. I wouldn't be so sure of that. It's actually pretty refreshing to have someone younger be interested in your work. I hope that's true. Because I stole another glance as well, and then turned towards the path she'd come from. I'll be on my way now. Where is Lily waiting for you? In front of the mansion. Well, we can go together then. There is no path in the woods beyond the well, so I joined Kozawa and turned back towards the way we had come. We parted ways and we reached the mansion. Okay, so I think Narsaki's gone. And we're going to see what happens next. I wonder what Sachiko's going to end up doing. And like how her. Like, if her choices are going to lead her down a good path. Ooh, this is that mysterious music where something, usually when something interesting happens. So next time should be an exciting episode, I'm guessing. But hey, you know what? As always, this has been a pleasure. Hopefully this was interesting. and It was very somber this time. Kind of, uh, I felt like we had a resolution. I almost wonder if the doll, like if Narasaki had Sachiko put the doll in the, in the furnace. And, like, that's the kind of twinge that she felt. Feeling like a person died, kind of like Takiko. But, I don't know. But yeah, that's a pretty solid confirmation we just had from, uh, from, uh, Kozawa that, um, Narasaki and Sachiko were just two sides of the same coin, effectively. It was still, it was, it was effectively Sachiko, but expressing Narasaki when she would talk to her in the library a lot. Or if she would, like, fall unconscious, maybe feel like she was sleeping and Narasaki was taking control. We'll see. But anyway, we'll have to see what ends up happening next time and see if we can learn more about what actually really ended up happening between Sachiko and Takako. And, uh, and everybody, really. But hey, this has been fun. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for spending time with me. As always, it's a pleasure having you. Pleasure having you in this series. And, I don't know. I hope that the ending's satisfactory. I'm sure it will be, but I really want to have some answers to stuff. I don't want too much stuff hanging, like hanging around and still being like big questions I don't have answers to but I don't know you guys seem pretty confident that it ends up okay so I'll take faith in that but anyway so tell the next video you're watching me or whatever you see me in next I'll see you there